Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the CPR seminar series. Uh, today is our great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sing Wang Han to give us an interesting presentation. So, uh, so before we start, let me briefly introduce our speaker today. Yeah. So our speaker, uh, Dr. Han, is a social political demographer, and he is currently assistant professor at Hong Kong University. Uh, uh, prior to the Hong Kong University, uh, Dr. Han was a postdoc research fellow at Cornell University, and he obtained his PhD in sociology at Harvard University. Uh, uh, Dr. Han's research focuses on the patterns, causes, and consequences of the fertility decline in uh, in in post-industrial societies, and okay, and uh, and uh, today his presentation topic is an empirical in investigation of the left-right political uh, fertility gap. So let's uh, welcome our speaker. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So let me start. So thank you, Dr. Wang, uh, and thank you for. Uh, your warm welcome and kind introduction. And also thank you for inviting me as a speaker uh, to this great seminar series at the Center for Family and Population Research. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, present my ongoing research, ongoing research today, and I hope you will enjoy my presentation too. So uh, before I begin, uh, let me tell you about the nature and the current status of this research. So, I'm considering uh, this research as kind of short research note, uh, kind of around 3,000 or 4,000 words, uh, as opposed to a poor, poor paper. So, and actually I plan to submit it to a journal in the format of a research note, uh, such as like a demography or general marriage and family uh, as a research note. Uh, this means that uh, the research that I'm going to present today is going to be very much descriptive uh, explanatory, uh, not as really a serious in contributing to existing theory or kind of interrogating the causal system or or kind of thing. It's, it's going to be really simple, descriptive, and explanatory. But I still believe that uh, if I get a comment or suggestion from you about how to build up this research uh, on the existing literature or other kind of uh, discourse, that would be greatly appreciated. So if you have any ideas on that kind of things, please let me know at the end of the presentation. So, and the other thing that I can promise is that it's gonna be a really short uh, presentation, maybe around like a 30 minutes. So it's not going to be around 40 or 50 minutes. So yeah, it's gonna be really short. Okay, okay so anyway, uh, so, so let's start. Uh, so let me begin by talking about the background of this research. So I think that uh, many of you uh, who are here and listening to my talk now are either demographers or uh, family researchers. So I assume that most of you are very much familiar with the issue of low fertility uh, and what's happening uh, in many post-industrial countries right now. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, but anyway, you should do it. So perhaps the most uh, significant uh, demographic change over the last decade uh, might be a substantial decline in the fertility rate in many parts of the post-industrial world. Uh, and as a key driver of population aging and shrinking labor supply, uh, sustained low birth rates uh, have been theorized to pose an uh, existential threat to the countries there's a negative impact on welfare systems, uh, healthcare, uh, and sustainable uh, economic development. So and this means that uh, the issue of low fertility uh, and its potential consequences is becoming more incorporated into the political debate, uh, not just in the academic debate. Uh, and as this becoming a part of the political discourse in many societies, some politicians and political commentators, uh, I mean, especially those in the extreme right or populist right side. I, I, I mean, I don't mean it's every politician, it's some politicians and political commentators, they are increasingly exploiting the issue of low fertility to increase their political visibility in, in their societies. 
so basically what they do is as follows. Uh, first, they utilize the issue of low fertility and population decline uh, to increase public concerns over the future of the nation. And second, they promote conservative or traditional traditional gender and family values, such as it's like the women are supposed to have and take care of their children, and thus they should bring the country out of the democratic crisis. So this kind of uh, political discourse or narrative. Uh, third, they blame in they blame the opposite side of the political spectrum in their countries uh, as the cause or the reason behind this democratic crisis. And ultimately, uh, they do these all things to increase their political muscle in their societies. Okay. So, and there are some political uh, propagandas that have been raised and promoted by populist or nationalist politicians on the far right side. Uh, the left right fertility, political fertility gap hypothesis, uh, which is the topic of my talk today, is a particular uh, and very popular type of such political propagandas. And there might be uh, some different versions of how this hypothesis is put forward. But the bottom line of this hypothesis is that uh, first, on average, uh, members of the political right have or they desire to have much more children than the left. And second, and therefore uh, the declining birth rates uh, in many parts of the world right now are actually driven and spearheaded by young people uh, who are politically leaning to the left. So this is what the left right political fertility gap hypothesis is about. And, and the first time I uh, myself witnessed this sort of political propaganda in the real uh, world political setting was the latest president, presidential election in South Korea. Uh, and this was in uh, 2022. Uh, and the election happened when the total fertility rate in South Korea has continued to fall uh, since the late 20, 2000s. So in 2022, when the election happened, the total fertility rate in South Korea was point, uh, 0 0.78. This is kind of the world's lowest uh, figure. So, and so the background, the time background was like this in 2022. And this guy, uh, this guy on the right side, so this guy uh, was the presidential candidate of the conservative party at that time. Uh, and he's now the president of South Korea. So basically he made it. So. Actually, what he, what he did during this campaign was uh, like this. So first, basically, uh, he was kind of uh, nothing in the political scene, just like Donald Trump. So he has been out of, he has been entire his life in the out of the political scene. So he basically kind of outsider in the political scene. So, so he needed to some kind of uh, provocative political campaigns to increase his political visibility. So. Basically what he did and what he and his campaign team did is, so they decided to take advantage of the low fertility issue uh, to blame uh, feminism and more broadly, the political left and the Democrat, Democratic Party in South Korea. So they actually blame feminism and the political left as the root cause of the country's demographic problem. Uh, because from their perspective, from this guy's perspective, uh, political left or feminists, they usually don't have do not have kids as much as the political right or just they from their perspective it's just normal people. So the political left they do not have much kids to uh, bring the South Korea out of the democratic crisis. Okay, so this is what actually uh, his campaign was like that, and it was quite successful because so he got his attention from the uh, the public, and he finally basically. Ultimately, he became a president. And political commentators, some of political commentators in South Korea, they actually comment that, so this approach was quite successful at the beginning of the presidential campaign. Okay, so yeah. So uh, so you may consider uh, this sort of uh, left to left political political gap hypothesis, this propaganda, uh, you may consider this as very much Korean specific uh, political phenomenon but actually it is not. 
So this is because over the past decade, uh, many post-industrial countries, uh, including uh, and especially the countries that used to maintain relatively high fertility rates until the early 21st century. So these countries have experienced a significant decline in their fertility rates. And the United States, the United States of America is the prime example uh, in this line of uh, issue. Uh, so the United States was used to be the, one of the few countries that uh, were able to maintain the level of replacement level fertility rate, like a 2.1 TFR, uh, until the early 2021st century. But after the economic crisis in 2008, the total fertility rate in the United States has actually dramatically declined over and over. So in 2020, uh, the total fertility rate in the United States is uh, 1.60, is actually the all time low, including uh, the war period. Then, and other countries, so like Sweden, Finland, Norway, these countries used to have a really high fertility rate uh, compared to other post industrial countries, but their fertility rate so declined all along since the 2010. And the United States is one of the prime examples in this trend. So, and as a result, uh, the left right politica, politica, polit, political fertility gap hypothesis has been frequently raised and endorsed by some politicians and political media uh, in the United States uh, who are actually striving to increase their political clout in their political scene. So this guy, uh, the right side, the, this guy's name is the J.D. Benz. Uh, so he is actually the incumbent Ohio State Senate, Ohio Senate, and he was the most famous figure uh, who brought the left-right fertility, political fertility gap hypothesis to the forefront of his election campaign. And actually what he did is he blamed the Democrats as the childless left um, to and the, the, uh, blamed the left as the kind of cause of the, this uh, fertility decline problem in the United States. Uh, and eventually he won the election. So, and actually what he did is so here are some quotes from the J.D. Benz during his campaign. So, which is like a, so like quote, so we should worry that in America, uh, family formation, our birth rates and, and ton of indicators of family health have collapsed. And quote, uh, the childless left have no physical uh, commitment to over the future of this country. So this is basically his kind of, one of his remarks during his campaign. Uh, and his uh, these remarks from J.D. Benz were immediately uh, picked up by uh, the right-wing political media, saying that, quote, work socialist progressives hate babies more than anything else, uh, and the left, de left detest the fact that there are children. This is kind of really strong words and remarks from the political right side, and is actually is he's the J.D. Benz is not the only uh, polit politician in the United States who kind of uh, uh, unhesitatingly are raising this kind of uh, political propaganda um, on the childless left the, or the left right political political hypothesis. And you can see other countries, other societies, this is is very much uh, common so in the United Kingdom in Italy, Hungary, and or other European, uh, Western European countries. So all sort of this kind of uh, similar pol political propaganda based on uh, the left, right, political, political hypothesis is very much uh, growing right now. So, uh, so, so after looking through uh, this political discourse on the left, right, political hypothesis, so basically two thoughts came into my mind. Uh, the first thought was that, so this sort of political propaganda based on uh, blaming and scapegoating is not a productive way to deal with the low fertility problem. And the second thought was actually more related to my identity as a demographer uh, and empirical researcher. So which is that does the red right fertility, political fertility gap hypothesis have empirical support? Uh, more specifically, 
uh, is the political right more willing to have a or another child uh, than the political left? And to what extent the gap is substantial? So this is uh, actually the questions that I, uh, questions that came into my mind after looking through all these uh, political discourse or political propaganda. So my, this question, so based on this question, I look into the existing literature, uh, but what I found is that uh, despite the proliferation of narratives on the left-right fertility gap, uh, little empirical work has examined whether conservatives wish to and actually intend to have more children than liberals. So, so we have we do not have many kind of uh, many uh, empirical research on this topic. Uh, actually, uh, Feeder and Huber's they are actually psychologists. So Feeder and Huber's research is one of very few scholarly articles that examine the empirical validity of the left right fertility gap hypothesis. And this research was actually uh, really carefully conducted, but my takeaway is that it has some uh, potential limitations and disadvantages. Um, so I'm going to sh uh, briefly talking about his uh, their uh, uh, approach. So the analytic sample uh, in this research is men and women who are above the age of 42. So basically they analyzed people uh, those who supposedly completed their childbearing because it is above 42. Uh, and based on this analytic example, uh, uh, they analyzed the association between uh, the respondents' self-defined political orientation uh, and their number of biological children. So uh, the key assumption here uh, is that uh, a person's political orientation uh, before having kids is equal to his or her political orientation after having kids. So uh, the, the respondent's political orientation does not change after having kids. So this is basically um, the key assumption here. Uh, and so in more uh, formally speaking, the pers they assume that the person's political orientation at the age of 42 or above uh, can retrospectively be the causal precedence of the number of kids they have. So this is the basic assumption of this research. And, but as we know, this assumption is too strong uh, and it's not easily cannot be, hold, uh, cannot be held in the real world setting. So this is because the experiences of having kids and, and raising kids may shape and change an individual's political orientation in a certain way, uh, as much as the other way around. So for example, there are actually some empirical studies on this kind of uh, issue. So for example, so Ebonia Washington, she's actually the economist uh, and it's titled, uh, it's her, article on this topic titled How Daughters Affect Their Legislator Fathers Voting on Women's Issue. So actually she, what she showed is that, so she showed that the experience of childbearing and child raising and also the gender of kids, whether it is son or, or it is daughter. Um, so the experience of childbearing and child raising may prospectively influence the father's political views and orientation. So actually she, uh, uh, empirically showed that this kind of uh, how having children change and shape uh, their parents' political views and ident uh, orientation. And also the sociologists, Dr. Corney and Rauscher, so they also showed kind of similar arguments in, the, in this paper. So this means that uh, the relationship between one's political orientation uh, and this person's number of kids may be mutually constituted. Uh, so we cannot assume that uh, a person's political orientation after the prime childbearing ages uh, is the same as this person's political orientation before having kids, okay? So this is one problem of uh, Feeder and Huber's uh, research. Uh, the other small issue of Feeder and Huber's research is the problem of so-called over-control. Uh, or also known as the included variable bias. So, and this means that uh, the uh, Feeder and Huber, they might have included too many control variables in their models. 
So, so let me just quickly talk about this. So, so let's assume that so if we are interested in the association between an individual's political orientation and the individual's politically related outcomes, so we should control for confounders, right? So confounders like the so most uh, uh, prime example of the confounder in this case is age, so because age can influence both uh, an individual's political orientation and their politically intention and behaviors. But we should control uh, these confounders, but we should avoid controlling for uh, post-industry, uh, post-treatment variables or potential mediators uh, through which political orientation affect uh, child bearing. So, so if this might be kind of uh, labor market status, income or religiosity, which might be influenced by uh, one's political orientation or political views. Um, so if, uh, if you control this kind of potential mediators between political orientation and uh, the child bearing outcomes, so it will result in the underestimation of the true association between uh, political orientation and their fertility, uh, fertility related outcomes. So basically, so, so what we should do is we should control for confounders, but we should avoid controlling for uh, post-treatment variable. It's, it's, it's actually basically we should not include too much in, uh, control variables in order to estimate the true uh, association between uh, political orientation and child bearing. So actually Fieder and Hubert, they uh, included too much uh, control variables in their models. So what they found is they actually they found null relationship, null association, non-association between uh, political orientation and the number of kids, but this might be kind of a bias, uh, which might be caused by uh, this over controlling issue. So that is kind of tiny uh, problem of the Feeder and Huber's research. So uh, basically, so based on this, considering these uh, issues of the previous studies, uh, I basically, uh, the goal of this, the goal, the main goal of this uh, exploratory research is that, so I'm going to actually test the validity of the left right fertility gap hypothesis uh, by addressing the limitations of prior research, especially uh, Feeder and Huber's research. So I'm going to take three, three strategies. The first, uh, I use parity specific fertility intention as the dependent variable, not as like uh, the number of kids they have. So by analyzing uh, uh, parity specific, by analyzing fertility intentions, as opposed to the number of kids, I'm able to examine the contemporaneous relationship between an individual's political orientation and his or her intention to have another child, one child or another child in each parity. So it is not going to be a re retrospective one. It is actually contemporaneous relationship between uh, an individual's political orientation uh, and their uh, attitude toward childbearing. And second, I'm going to avoid controlling for covariates that could operate uh, as potential pathways by which political orientation influence uh, fertility intention. So I'm going to try to avoid uh, the included variable bias. And finally, I, I'm going to analyze 32 European countries at, as the analytic sample. So as you might know, so European countries, most European countries has experienced uh, many of the European countries has experienced uh, the fertility decline over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. So, so Europe, so based on this, Europe uh, might be an ideal setting for testing the hypothesis uh, empirical adequacy, and it might be an ideal setting for discussing the implications of the findings. So basically uh, in my research, uh, exploratory research, I'm going to consider these three issues. Okay. So, okay, so that was what I'm going to do with this research. And let me briefly talk about the data uh, and methods section. So I used two different data sets to examine the left-right fertility, political fertility gap hypothesis. So I used this uh, two different data sets uh, simply because of the, the issue of triangulation. That is, I really wanted to check whether my preferred findings in one data set uh, is gonna be the European Social Survey. 
So my, uh, as I said, my preferred findings in European social survey uh, are generally consistent with other data sets. So I really wanted to do a triangulation, but, uh, uh, but for today, I'm going to mainly focus on uh, the analysis based on European social survey, because this is my primary data. Uh, so I used, so yeah, so I'm not going to talk very much about the International Social Survey Program uh, data. So, okay, so I used a uh, pooled cross-sectional data from the round two and the round five of European Social Survey. Uh, and the analytic sample uh, at the country level is 32 European countries. Uh, and I analyzed men and women aged between 18 to 40 uh, the so-called uh, the prime childbearing age groups. And the sample size at the individual level is uh, 9,726. Uh, like I said, uh, my dependent variable uh, is volatility intentions within a three-year time frame. So this is asked by the questionnaire, uh, do you plan to have a child within the next three years? And this is measured in the five point Likert scale uh, from uh, definitely not to definitely yes. And uh, I consider this as kind of continuous variable, but uh, when I do this kind of the different man uh, manipulation, uh, formulation of these different kinds kind of, uh, uh, as like a, uh, a dummy variables or other kind of, uh, of formulation. So the, basically my key, uh, several, uh, my preferred findings are basically the same. Um, okay, so, and my restricted my sample to those who currently live with a different sex husband, wife or partner, uh, because these groups are known as those who are most likely to consider having children uh, in this context. Uh, and as I said, I take parity specific approach uh, to uh, to make uh, the same baseline because so I'm going to uh, so so my analytic sample is like a kind of a three groups those who have do, doesn't those who do not have kids right now and those who uh, and I'm to analyze their intention to have their first kids and the first to second kids and second to the third kids so I'm going to take a parity specific approach when analyzing fertility intention so. Uh, as fertility related outcomes, fertility intention has some advantages. Uh, so first, the fertility intention is within a three year time frame are highly predictive of realized fertility. So it has kind of predictive power. But at the same time, fertility intention is a really valid measure of the psychological construct uh, underlying childbearing, such as one's positive perceptions and commitment to become a parent. So is really nice uh, measure to compare uh, two groups uh, to compare to so whether one group is more likely to child prone or not. So this is a very measure. So time, time is quite tight, so I'm gonna speed up. So, okay, so, and the key independent variable is the political orientation. Uh, and this is measured by the left, right cell placement scale. Um, so, so actually the zero is the, the far left, the five is center and 10 is the far right. So actually I'm going to include this as a continuous variable uh, where higher values indicate the more conservative, more right uh, political orientation. And a possible nonlinear relationship is tested uh, with more flexible functions. I'm going to talk more about this. So, uh, so basically the method I'm using is the random intercept, random slope, two level, multi-level models. And actually I'm interested in two estimates. The first is the fixed effects, uh, which shows the average associations between political orientation uh, and fertility intentions across 30, 32 European countries. Uh, the second estimate uh, that I inter I'm interested in is the random effects, especially the random slope, uh, which shows how countries vary around the average association, okay? Uh, and these two estimates are actually computed with the simulation method. Uh, and um, so, as I said, I uh, to avoid the over control problem, I only control for age as a compounder. 
uh, and I do not control other kind of possible potential uh, post-treatment variables. Um, okay, so yeah, that is my analytical strategy. And here are my uh, findings. So before talking about the results of the analysis of fertility detention, so let me begin uh, by briefly showing the country level association uh, between political orientation and total fertility rate. Uh, so here is actually, uh, uh, the lab channel is actually based on the data from the round two, uh, 2006 TFR, and this is TFR in 2013. Uh, in both panels, the x-axis is the percentage of self-defined left. So it's, it's actually a higher percentage means that it's actually dominated by young people who are polit politically leaning toward the left. And y-axis is the total fertility rate. And in both panels, in like a 2006 TFR and 2013 TFR, actually, I did not find any kind of systematic and significant relationship between uh, uh, the political uh, leftness and the fertility rate at the country level. It's basically none. Even if uh, those countries, uh, so basically I do not find any kind of uh, systematic and statistically significant positive association, uh, negative association. Actually the negative association means that the left right fertility, fertility gap hypothesis is correct. Actually, I did not find any strong uh, evidence to support uh, the left right fertility gap hypothesis at the country level. But as I said, this is only country level association so the evidence is only suggested. So I should uh, talk uh, about uh, the individual level analysis of fertility intention. So actually it is the sample here is a male sample uh, and parity zero, which means that those who do not have children at this moment, okay? Uh, so, and this is only male sample. Uh, so the left panel shows the simulated fixed effect of political orientation. So here is the labeled as LR scale. Uh, and these higher values indicate more conservative uh, right-wing political orientation. And this here, this left panel, uh, this represents the average association between political orientation and fertility intention across 32 countries. So here, uh, the coefficient is positive, uh, 0 0.35. This means that uh, uh, actually, th those with men with uh, more conservative political orientation is actually more likely to plan to have birth their first child. But the association uh, here is not statistically significant. Uh, and the overall association across 32 countries is this the positive association is not statistically significant. Uh, and the right panels show the simulated distribution of the random effects. And my focus here is on the bottom graph, uh, which shows the country specific variation uh, in the association between political orientation uh, and men's uh, intention to have their first child. So here, the point to estimate above the zero is actually uh, the political right is more willing to have their first child. Uh, and the uh, black highlighted is actually the association is statistically significant. But as we can see uh, from this, the bottom graph, so only two countries out of 32 countries, uh, this positive association, uh, which means that uh, the empirical support for the left-right uh, fertility gap hypothesis is the case, only two countries. And the rest of 30 countries, the, basically the association is not really uh, systematic or really very much positive, okay? It's only two countries. Um, and this is the female sample uh, so at parity zero. And here also the, the situation is very much similar. Uh, the coefficient is positive, but is really a negligible coefficient and is not statistically significant. And here at the bottom graph on the right panel, again, it's only two countries. It's actually the Russia and actually so, uh, what is that, like Portugal or something? Yeah, yeah, yes, only two countries, uh, the political right, woman with political right orientation uh, is more likely to intend to have of their first child. And the rest of the countries, 30 countries, it is not the case, okay? 
Uh, and let's see uh, the parity one. Uh, the sample who have already one child and their intention to have a second child. And this is a male sample. So basically, again, uh, uh, the overall association between the political orientation uh, and fertility, the second order fertility intention is not uh, significant. And here, the bottom graph on the right side, only three countries, uh, uh, the Russia, Ukraine, and Germany, uh, only three countries, uh, this is the, the statistically significant case, um, and the rest of uh, countries, it is not. Same here. Here, the overall uh, is actually the parity one of female sample. Uh, so basically, here, the overall association is even negative, although it is, is statistically uh, insignificant. Um, um, and again, only two countries out of 30, 32 countries, uh, the, the, the woman with politically right orientation are more likely to intend to have a second child than the rest of political uh, orientation group. Okay. And finally, this is actually parity two. Uh, those who already have two children and their intention to have third child. Again, uh, actually the overall association is negative, which means that uh, uh, overall the, uh, the men with a more uh, conservative political orientation is actually have less likely to intend to have uh, their third child. But again, it's not statistically significant. Here, uh, six countries uh, out of 32 countries, uh, uh, the, the left, right, fertility, political hypothesis, uh, I mean, the, the right has more, a greater intention to have a uh, third child is actually the case. It's a relatively more, uh, greater number than the other uh, parities. But still, I would say it's, um, 26 countries out of 32 countries, uh, this kind of uh, political right uh, wings uh, greater intention to have third child is not the case, okay? Um, and this is finally a female sample at parity two. Uh, again, I did not find any kind of convincing evidence that in many countries, uh, the women with politi political right is more willing to have their uh, third child. This is not the case. So basically this is uh, what I, uh, found uh, based on my uh, uh, the uh, analysis, the, the key analysis. So you might consider that uh, the relationship between political orientation and volatility intention might be nonlinear. So we should need to test uh, the more flexible functions of the political orientation with a uh, kind of category variables. So here I included the political orientation into a three category uh, uh, dummy variables. The right is the reference group, the center and left is the comparison groups. And here at each parity and in different uh, gender group, uh, I did not have strong, I did not find strong evidence that uh, the political right is more willing to have their first or another child uh, in each parity. I did not find it. And this is another sensitive analysis uh, where the political orientation uh, is included as five category uh, function of the political orientation. So you might think that this is this might be the only case for the extreme right, the far right people uh, that they might uh, want to have more children than the other political group. So here the extreme right uh, is included as the reference category and the rest for center right center, center left, extreme left as included as the, uh, the comparison groups. And here, uh, in any cases, I did not find uh, uh, statistically strong evidence that the extreme right is more willing to have their first child or another child uh, in each parity on, in different uh, gender groups, okay? So, okay, so this is basically what I found. Uh, uh, based on the European Social Survey. Uh, so basically I did not find, I did find null association between political orientation and fertility intention. So this non-association, but 
we, as we know, the statistically non-significant associations, it actually do not mean there is truly no association because fertility intention is the only one uh, possible fertility rate outcomes. And this might be or just a random uh, finding that it has might be, it involves kind of uncertainty and there might be other kind of fertility rate related outcomes that uh, uh, people may have different uh, visions based on their political orientation. So this means that we need to test more robustness checks with uh, uh, other uh, data sets. So that is what, the reason why I uh, used ISSP data, International Social Survey Program data, as kind of a uh, more complementary data set. Uh, and here, uh, oh, basically, so the reason why I uh, mainly focused on the European Social Survey is it has fertility intention variable, but it does not have other kind of uh, fertility related uh, variable. So that is the reason why I ask this data. So here, uh, the first alternative dependent variable is the number of ideal, the ideal number of children for a family to have. So in this dependent variable, again, I did not find uh, any strong evidence that uh, uh, the people's ideal number of children differ uh, by political orientation. And the second alternative dependent variable is actually the positive perception toward uh, having and raising children. So this variable is measured by the questionnaire uh, is looking at the children grow up is the greatest joy uh, in your life. It's like a, it's how much you, do you agree or disagree with this statement. So basically, I did not find any uh, uh, strong evidence that uh, the positive perceptions toward having and raising children uh, systematically differ by uh, an individual's political orientation. Uh, and the final alternative dependent variable is actually negative perception toward having uh, and raising children. And again, uh, I did not find a statistically significant relationship between uh, uh, political orientation and the negative perception toward having and or raising children. So basically, across these uh, different uh, sets of analysis, uh, my tentative empirical conclusion is that uh, people's attitudes and perception toward uh, childbearing uh, do not uh, systematically uh, differ by their uh, political orientations or political self-identification. Okay. So yeah. So, so this is my, this is what I found from uh, my uh, empirical analysis, and this is my uh, tentative conclusion and discussion. So as I said, uh, I did not find any strong evidence to support uh, the left-right fertility gap hypothesis. And my, uh, my kind of tentative conclusion is that the left-right fertility gap hypothesis is, is very much brought with empirical and conceptual uh, problems. First, as I have shown that there is no reliable evidence on whether the hypothesis is empirically supported or not. So the politicians and political commentators, they do not have a strong uh, base to argue that a certain political group is more likely to have more children than the other group. So this is actually, this hypothesis has empirical problem. Okay. And I think from my perspective, more a uh, serious problem of this sort of political propaganda is that it actually tries to explain a complex social phenomena such as the fertility, fertility decline in a really oversimplified framework. So basically what this uh, propaganda do is, does is the, it counterposes two sides of the political spectrum and points to one group as the the root cause of the problem. It's like a democratic crisis, okay? And I think the, uh, I think for politicians and policymakers, uh, this oversimplified framing of the low fertility might have some merits uh, because it allows them to unite and to negate uh, the obligation to make tough, uh, complex policy decisions. So basically what they need to do is they just blame the other side of the political spectrum and they do nothing uh, to deal with this democratic crisis. So, so this sort of political propaganda might have merit to these kind of uh, politicians and policymakers, okay? But as I said, 
uh, as I continuously said, uh, this sort of uh, uh, political propaganda is really problematic uh, because it may thwart constructive discussion on on the origin and the nature of the contemporary volatility declines and how we can deal with uh, uh, this politi uh, volatility decline issue to for the future generation. So yeah, it is actually basically this, we should avoid uh, to pro uh, propose this sort of political propaganda uh, based on blaming and scapegoating. And we should think more about a uh, more productive way to deal with this uh, uh, issue. So basically, this is my uh, research. Uh, I am, yeah, looking forward. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to your uh, comments, feedback, or question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Siwon, for this very interesting presentation. Okay, so uh, any questions from our audience? <clears throat> okay, then uh, I can ask uh, one question. So, okay. uh, yeah, so it's uh, very interesting that, so, but, uh, you know, I, well, mm -hmm. because we can only see this hypothesis in kind of political propaganda. So I'm just uh, considering uh, if there are any theoretical mechanisms you know, through which that political right or left mm -hmm. orientation will lead to more less uh, children. So, you know, what what are the possible mechanisms? So this is I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, at this moment, uh, I only uh, 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 propose this research as kind of research note, uh, finding a kind of uh, descriptive association. And I did not uh, tell anything about the theoretical, theore possible uh, theoretical foundation of the left right political, mm -hmm. political gap hypothesis. I think one possible uh, theoretical framework might be uh, the second demographic transition theory. Mm -hmm. Basically, actually, the original, as far as I understand, the original, uh, the second demographic transition theory is actually proposed that. Uh, is as societies becoming more liberal uh, mm. based on their kind of uh, materialization and other kind of the fulfillment of material need, uh, societies becoming more liberal and it's more leaning towards more like a, it's like a identity political issues like a, a feminism or mm. other kind of more politically uh, um, liberal issues like immigration. Is that societies and people are more getting uh, open-minded towards these issues and this is partly the mechanism. Uh, and so, and these uh, people of, uh, leaning toward more liberal or uh, leftism, this may lead to uh, to decide them to not to having kids. So, okay, mm. so this is kind of, so this is a possible uh, theory uh, uh, that at how, Political left right is uh, the, the the left right political political hypothesis might be proposed, but I don't really want to blame uh, the second democratic transition uh, theories to uh, sort of one of them. So I actually what I'm now is actually I deliberately avoid mentioning the second democratic transition theory uh, in this case. So yeah, it might be if you have any idea possible idea on this, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Adam, you have a question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Actually, I enjoyed the presentation and I find these questions very interesting. Um, thank you. Um, so my question here is, uh, how do we... Um, how do we conceptualize left and right? Oh, I mean, this question could mm -hmm. be stupid to many people, but, uh, but but I think in different countries, maybe left and right could be defined uh, slightly differently because for example, in Hong Kong, for example, um, mm -hmm. what do we mean by left? What kind of uh, partisans uh, are, are mm -hmm. left and what uh, what, parties, what parties represent the right? So um, I, I just think that political factors, political attitudes may be related to fertility ideal. But the mm -hmm. thing is, uh, it could be a multi-dimensional. So, for example, in the newspapers that you 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 uh, cited, mm -hmm. some of them actually refer to the attitudes towards a uh, gender, uh, uh, anti-family, uh, familism things, mm -hmm. and and actually could also be referring to the uh, uh, li liberalisms in in the economic uh, sphere. Or, or or maybe political reforms uh in the Hong Kong context. So mm -hmm. maybe different countries have their own uh political agendas and, and different situations. 
And so your your study because it's a it's a uh, international comparison. So I just mm. wonder uh whether you uh, how, how do you think about this this issue? So this is question number one. Uh, so sorry for, for for I also have another question. So question two mm. is uh so you mentioned that you do not want to over control. So you do not control for uh, some uh potential mediators. So can you tell us uh, what are those factors that you you uh, intentionally avoided to control? And because to me that um, what because I think it is very important to determine what factors are for the political ideology. So maybe employment status is a mediator, but employment status could also be a factor of why they believe in political right. Mm -hmm. So because long long term unemployment may lead to anti migrant uh, sentiment, things like that. So so I just want to know more about what's your 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 uh, your what what do you think about this? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. These two questions uh, and comments are really important things. Uh, so let me begin with the first uh, 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 comments on the political orientation uh, variable. So yeah, actually you're right. So uh, and so actually that is the reason why I really, I actually exclusively focus on European countries because I believe that these countries have kind of a relatively similar uh, political context, but still, there are some uh, might be issues like, uh, for example, in post-socialist countries like uh, Poland and SAC, uh, they're kind of uh, in these countries, uh, whether being the left or right might have different meanings in being the left or right in France, Germany, or uh, other uh, Western European countries. So still have, there might be a difference. So, so the reason, uh, but still that, that being said, uh, it is still the case that uh, what usually people uh, uh, is what actually is a me can be measured by this uh, political orientation self uh, placement scale is that is is more uh, actually believe the overall political, not simply and uh, not just specific kind of attitude toward economic issues or gender issues. This is more broadly uh, uh, their uh, kind of orientation or their uh, preferences. Uh, uh, about having uh, toward the political party. So, yeah, so, yeah, but still that uh, it might be the possible that uh, it has kind of uh, different meanings in different countries still it is possible the case. So, um, so I am actually what I have been trying to do is actually I interrogate the existing literature on this uh, self-placement political retention variable. Uh, whether this is actually comparable across countries. So basically uh, what they uh, propose actually suggest is that, uh, so the, this uh, a political orientation, orientation variable is, is better to be used in only a relatively uh, a similar context like uh, Europe, uh, Asia, North America, uh, it's like, or uh, other uh, contexts. So, because this, in different different uh, area regions or in different country uh, context, so relatively the, the political orientation variable has a relatively similar meaning. Uh, so yeah, that is uh, uh, partly the reason why I, I only focused on European uh, countries here. But still, as I said, uh, so we should uh, think more about uh, whether the meaning of political orientation based on this left-right scale is actually comparable across countries. And that is really a good thing that I need to consider. Uh, the second issue, uh, the issue of over control. Uh, so basically uh, it is actually, so let me uh, explain based on this. Uh, yeah, so uh, basically it is very much certain that uh, we should control age because it affects both uh, political orientation and their fertility intention. So it should be controlled. Uh, but there might be other uh, uh, covariates that may be the mediator. It's like, a, as you said, the labor market status, it might be a mediator, but actually it might be the, conf uh, actually not confounder, it actually, uh, uh, yeah, it might be actually the confounders because the labor market status uh, is like, a, as you said, the long-term unemployment might, employment might influence uh, one's political orientation. And it also has, because it's very much related to it, uh, this person's economic resources, it also affect uh, politicality outcomes like fertility intention. So 
but but because it's the uh the uh the reality of this uh for example the labor market status is not strictly either confounder or uh, post treatment variables. Uh, my strategy was to kind of exclude this all uh, more uh, is uh, quirky variables. Uh, uh, but uh, to, to relieve your concern about this, so I actually conducted very, uh, various uh, robustness checks to include all these possible covariates. It might be possibly confounders or post treatment variables. So basically, my original finding is actually null findings. So including these variables actually further confirm the null findings. So, yeah, so that is my uh, kind of strategy toward uh, dealing with these post-treatment variables and confounders, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for the clarification. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. actually regarding the confounder and the control variables, mm -hmm. I'm also thinking whether maybe you can consider to control mm -hmm. some variables at country level, such as uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so the country level, family policy, and so on. They can influence both their political orientation and the fertility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. maybe uh, there are still just non-significant results <laughs> after controlling for yeah. everything. Yeah. Okay, thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, and the Pook, you have another question, please. Thank you very much, Tinwon, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you, um, my question is, uh, if I'm not wrong, you exclude people who, I mean, you only include uh, people who identify themselves as heterosexual. In right, the yeah. Sample, right? Mm -hmm. So I wonder to what extent you exclude the sample, I mean, you know, people who are not identifying themselves as heterosexual from uh, your sample mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that might have, I mean, if you include people who are, regardless of their sexual orientations, right? Mm -hmm. How that might affect your results. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, especially regarding intention to have children, especially mm -hmm. if um, marriage is, uh, gay marriage is not re legalized in those countries, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but maybe, you know, and I understand that with, across European countries there are variations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and that kind, that's also related to, um, uh, could be correlated with uh, political orientation, mm -hmm. right? So can you maybe, can you comment on that about that decision or did you do any um, sensitivity analysis to include everyone and mm -hmm. has the result changed? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so that's a really good point. So uh, first of all, uh, so the reason I, why I only focused on the heterosexual, uh, actually currently uh, married or partnered uh, individuals is that, so this data is quite old. A European social survey is like a 2004, around 2004 and to the, around 2006. So at the time, uh, there is no identification variable of one's sexual orientation or uh, other kind of uh, possible variables to identify whether one is uh, uh, actually sexual orientation. So. I didn't, I was not able to actually distinguish between uh, these samples to other samples. So basically I was not able to analyze uh, specific uh, analysis on using these uh, sexual minority groups. So mm -hmm. yeah, that is my uh, possible limitation of this research because mm -hmm. I only focused on heterosexual uh, uh, and currently partnered people. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing uh, regarding the robustness checks or sensitivity analysis that I did is, uh, uh, it's not actually about a sexual orientation. I only uh, focused on those who are not currently partnered or married, just kind of a single mm -hmm. uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, in this specific group, uh, uh, there is no specific, uh, no systematic association between uh, their political orientation uh, and their fertility condition. This is might be possible because they are unmarried. So even in European context, they do not seriously consider having their biological children in the near future. So mm -hmm. there are, are some kind of really, uh, a lot of noises is coming up here. But as far as, as at least in terms of uh, people who are not currently partnered or married, uh, the non-association between political orientation and fertility intention still hold uh, in this group. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I assume that this non-association is quite universal across different demographic groups, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so any other questions?
Okay, no, yeah, so then, uh, yeah, I, I, I have a, just a last very short comment. So, because I find mm -hmm. it interesting that you find some country variation. So, uh, I, I think uh, this might be something that uh, reviewers or other readers are quite interested in because you raise the, uh, you, you raise the hypothesis, but it seems from the data set that there can be a debate mm -hmm. whether right or left, uh, Politically oriented people have want to have a more or less a uh, children. Yeah, so it will be uh, quite interesting that you know mm -hmm. if the possibility to explore some country variation and there can be possibly some country level moderators to mm -hmm. decide uh, whether you know how political orientation is related to fertility intention in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so if there are no other questions, so let's uh, join me to thank uh, Dr. Sing Wang Han today for this very interesting presentation. And please uh, continue to pay attention to our activities in CFPR. Okay, so then, um, okay, then have a nice weekend. Okay, so this is the end of, uh, end of our webinar today. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. you. Thank you for all. Yeah. Thank you.